So, I mean, you really do have almost a unique perspective on trade, global trade, not just U.S. trade. How do you see it right now? Are we seeing the effects already of the tariffs that have been imposed? We are, and it's certainly not just the, the effects of the actual tariffs, but to your point, the uncertainty, the anticipation of what this could mean. Soybean prices are at an 11-year low. Uh, and they're, they're down about 20 percent from just a few months ago. So part of that is it's also been another good harvest. It's been a good growing season in North America and South America, in Brazil, I should say. But nonetheless, there already has been an impact. To what extent is it a global market? So if uh, you're constrained about what you can bring to the United States, you can get it from someplace else. And so it all makes up and then the United States will sell it to there. But does it really disrupt the trade patterns? I don't. I think I might choose a different word than disrupt. It certainly rearranges the trade patterns, and so the Chinese have committed to not purchase U.S. soybeans either because of you know pride and because of the trade war that's going on, but also because of price. So it's making sources like South America cheaper, but also an alternative source of supply. So it rearranges the supply chains. And we're definitely going to get nerdy with soybeans uh, in just a second. So get excited. But I think the broader question, this you know, to Mike and Dave, both of you, is: Are trade wars disinflationary? or inflationary uh, and from a CEO perspective and economic perspective well, what do we know well, from so far? an economic perspective yes <laughs> they, are to both. Both. To both. they are both because some products go down in price uh, as David's talking about and then a lot of products that we import go up in price because we're paying more uh, it is a tax on consumers the tariffs not on the other country now the real question in terms of how much inflation we get and I guess David could answer this is how much can companies absorb within their margins of the increased tariffs. Mm -hmm. So from where you sit, Dave. I agree with Mike. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually what we all I say. Like yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> what that guy said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What he said. <laughs> you know, relative to food prices, I mean, right now, as I mentioned, soybean prices are down for the mm -hmm. reasons we described. But in, in, there it has been an impact. We've had about five or six years of really good weather, really good growing patterns in North and South America. However, statistically speaking, you get a drought or a weather disruption about every two and 10 years. For example, they've had really hot and dry conditions in Argentina this year. Mm -hmm. That has impacted the soybean crop, but the major producers of soybean, the soybeans, the U.S. and Brazil, have had really good harvests. So right now, it's deflationary. It's good news for the consumer. So with respect to agricultural products, can these supplies chains just switch fairly quickly? That is to say, suppose we have this trade battle, whatever you want to call it, go on, and it ends. Mm. Can it go back to the way it was, or are there some things, some st actions are taken by companies such as yours that really are hard to turn around in the short run? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, David. And I'd say, in theory, it could go back to the way it was, but I think there's a couple of things that work here. One is, what is the long-term impact on looking at the U.S. as a reliable trade partner? Mm. If you are a country like China, which has imported a significant amount of U.S. agricultural products, could you expect them to say, gee, I don't want to take that risk anymore. I'm going to switch where I'm going to supply, but I'm also going to change sources of protein. So instead of including soybeans in feed for chickens for their livestock, they will switch to corn, for mm -hmm. example. So short term, and maybe if it were fixed quickly, we might go back to the way it was. But long term, I'm concerned it has a detrimental effect, detrimental effect on the U.S. ag economy. Also sourcing. So this brings me back to the 70s. And when you had a 24-hour embargo on uh, soybean imports into Japan, soybean exports into Japan, Japan started making investments in to Brazil that like in essence created the soybean market in Brazil. I mean that's an effect we don't talk that much about in terms of the longer term capital allocation for these big countries that are sourcing their commodities, Mike. Yeah, it's a little bit easier with agriculture because you have a harvest and you have stored grains and people can buy from different places. Although you get into futures contracts, it gets a little more complicated, but it's really hard for the people who are going to be hit in manufacturing, electronics, things like that, where they have supply chains from around the world and they have factories that cost hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to build the auto industry in particular is worried that the president might put on auto tariffs so it will be a very slow move to change supply chains in other industries so, so but, the, from sorry. where you sit I mean what do you think like are you gonna see China start to make investments uh, in agricultural commodities in other locations and then not in the US and that is a huge longer-term disruptor I think I think that's exactly what will happen now look back at a couple of years ago 
China bought two companies, Noble and Nadira, so they clearly have ambitions. Kofco, the state-owned enterprise, have ambitions to be in the agricultural supply chain. And, and I think it also will start to extend. You see them making investments in minerals and mineral extraction in Africa. But it, that's just, just it. When you get a, a trade disruption like what we're seeing, they're not no market is going to sit and just say, okay, that's going to be fine. They're going to respond in some way. So Dave, take us inside your planning process. When you meet with your chief mm -hmm. financial officer, we go through budget process, your longer term planning. Mm -hmm. What do you build in? Mm -hmm. Do you build in this is going to go away mm -hmm. right away? It's going to last for five years? How do you anticipate that and how do you make decisions today uh, that could have effects for the next two, five years? You know, right now, David, I think it's a matter of, of not building it in. I don't think we, we haven't said, okay, we're going to budget this way that there's going to be this disruption or there's going to be these trade wars for a long extended period of time. However, the longer it goes on, the more you have to think, all right, what does this mean as far as sourcing, storage, transportation, and shifting the center of gravity, which is my concern that it shifts it away from the U.S. farmer. So right now we're not event planning, but certainly you event plan relative to what it could mean for your budget as far as up or down on the results for the year. What conversations are you able to have at the White House that are different than the ones you had, say, 10 years ago? We have been more in touch with our legislators, so our, our senators and our representatives. We've been very active in talking to the Secretary of Commerce, to the Secretary of Agriculture, who I think are sympathetic, but at the same time, uh, I, I recognize, we recognize that what they're pursuing is a tactic to make trade more fair and balanced. And ultimately, we're an American company. We understand what the reasons are behind some of the moves, but we just think their tac other, ta other tactics could be pursued to improve trade relations. So, Dave, not a day goes by, but President Trump doesn't say how much he loves farmers. Happened mm -hmm. again yesterday when he signed the South Korean agreement, <clears throat> saying we love farmers, love farmers. And whatever he believes in his heart, is he acting in a way that shows love to farmers? Is this ultimately going to benefit farmers mm. in the agriculture business? I, it depends on where this plays out. And so I, I do believe he does love farmers. But if you, I think if you talk to farmers, they're getting increasingly concerned as we go deeper into harvest season. And they've got a lot of product they want to get out of the fields and then traditionally send it to China, for example, that they will either have to find alternative markets or put into storage. And with lower prices, they make that decision. So I think short term, if this plays out effectively and we can get a better mm -hmm. uh, achieve what the administration wants to, then they'll be happy. But longer term, as I said, I think it's detrimental to the U.S. ag economy. Mm -hmm. I want to follow up on that because uh, we've heard that uh, the impact of the tariffs on farmers isn't as great right now as it could be because so many of them have futures contracts that are going to enable them to get a decent price. And now you have the president's payments from the agriculture department to the farmers. So it's not really hitting as hard as maybe the press would like to make it. But the farmers have to make a decision next year. Am I going Going to plant soybeans do I do I know where this is going exactly and and so as you said Mike farmers are great risk managers they understand futures markets they are increasingly uh, greater users of technology to understand weather patterns and so they will adapt they are resilient people it's a resilient industry however to your point they will also react when they make planning decision planting decisions next spring and so if the tariffs are still in place, if the markets are still disruptive, disrupted, they will make decisions to plant other crops or to not plant. But ultimately, there's a supply and demand response. 